I know what you're doing, Haim. I, I can feel <laughs> your negative energy. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKinty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about Pierce the Veil who I think of as kind of an unlikely success story. And for anybody who may not be familiar with the band, they play what I guess you could call like progressive post-hardcore, or as your stepmom might call it, screamo, that sounds like this. Maybe we're just having too much fun. They came up in kind of the same warp Tour scene as bands like Dance Gavin Dance, Escape the Fate, and Chiodos. And slowly but surely, they actually ended up outgrowing the same scene that created them, eventually hitting number four on the Billboard charts ahead of Radiohead and Rihanna. And it seemed like they were about to be the scene's next big breakthrough band, maybe this generation's Paramore or Fall Out Boy. Until suddenly, something terrible happened that jeopardized everything that they had worked for. Their drummer, Michael, Mike Fuentes was accused of inappropriate behavior with minors, abruptly left the band, and they went dark. And it seemed like that might be the end of Pierce the Veil, with no new music for years and years and years. Until just a few months ago, when they unexpectedly had a viral hit on TikTok with their old song, King for a Day, recently put out a new album for the first time in seven years, and they're building a whole new generation of fans, and people seem to love them more than ever. So what really happened behind the scenes? And is Pierce the Veil really truly here to stay or are they just another one of these bands that had a viral TikTok moment that's going to be here today gone tomorrow? Those are the questions that I will try to answer in this video. And also thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Personally, what I like about the game is all the customization. And with it being Raid's birthday, let's take a quick trip down memory lane with my starter champion, Kale. I remember choosing him years ago and conquering my very first dungeon with him. I hope I made Uncle Kale proud. And there's a ton to get excited about. I'm talking dedicated offers, free gifts, promo codes, events, and a brand new fusion event where you can get your hands on an anniversary themed legendary champion. Oh, and for all the Amazon Prime members who just got Genbo. Keep an eye out for the next drop with some very powerful Savage gear. It's available from March 2nd until March 30th. Use my link in the description of this video or scan my QR code right now to get insane bonuses. An epic champion called Kellen the Shrike, energy refills, magic potions, and XP brews. All new and existing players can get a bunch of free birthday gifts. Once you're in game after clicking on the links, just enter the promo code four years raid to get your hands on four legendary skill tomes plus other very useful stuff. It's simple. And once you're in the game and crushing your enemies, you can find me under the name PRMBA. And if you're fast enough, maybe you can even join my clan. Just hit the link in the description of this video and I will see you on the battlefield. Pierce the Veil formed way back in 2006 after Vic and Mike Fuentes' high school band Before Today changed their name to Pierce the Veil. And shortly after the name change, they announced that they were also signed to Equal Vision Records, posted a few songs to the band's MySpace account, and after touring with bands like Poison the Well, Chiodos, and From First to Last, they released their first album called A Flare for the Dramatic in the summer of 2007. And listening to that album now, it is incredibly impressive for a debut album from 2007. Like if you compare it to other bands that came out around the same time, for example, like Bless the Fall or Chiodos, it is just so much more polished and sophisticated. It sounds like they had already been around for five years and like this might be their second or third album. They also did Warp Tour 2008 and the Taste of Chaos Tour in 2009, supporting Thursday and Bring Me the Horizon among other bands. And Vic and Mike also did a side project called Isles and Glaciers with Craig Owens of Chiodos, Johnny Craig from Amorosa, and a few other people from the post-hardcore scene. Basically, they were putting in the work in the studio and on the road. And so it was no surprise that their next album was the breakthrough that they had been looking for. Selfish Machines, which came out in 2010. Here's the veil. 
took everything they learned along the way and, and made an album and took that time to make themselves better as musicians. I hope that's how people feel about the next album. This album was a very clear step up from their first one in pretty much every way, from songwriting to performances to production, with Tom Denny from A Day to Remember co-writing several of the songs. And for those who may not know, Tom was kind of A Day to Remember's secret weapon, who wrote a lot of their best stuff up to and including Common Courtesy. I think it should be yeah, right Shaq in the motherfucking house! What are you talking about Shaq for? And to be honest, at the time, I kind of wrote Pierce the Veil off as just another one of these scene bands that got popular because they had a cute singer with a cool haircut, which let's be real, definitely was part of their appeal. But if I'm being honest, their music actually has a lot more going on than I gave them credit for at the time. The album was actually very progressive. For example, the biggest single from the album called Car Fernalia, featuring Jeremy McKinnon from A Day to Remember is like kind of all over the place in a cool way, going from post hardcore to metalcore to kind of like ambient, almost post rock but still catchy in the same way that Avenged Sevenfold managed to write these like seven minute long prog songs that you could still somehow sing along to. The opening song and album Besitos also has some really cool Latin percussion in it. And then there's The Boy Who Could Fly, which is almost like skate punk, but with these like kind of Beatles-esque harmonies. <laughs> You can really tell them when it comes to songwriting and production, they put in the work. And all that work paid off. The album hit number one on the Billboard Heat Seekers chart, which for a band at that point in their career was a huge success and really showed the industry and fans that they were headed for bigger things. And honestly, if you've never given this album a listen front to back, you should. It's a lot more than just like scene music. And if anything, I'm almost surprised that scene kids liked it given how just honestly weird and progressive it is. But then again, there was also a lot of other kind of weird progressive stuff getting popular with scene kids at the time. So I guess the Warped Tour kids were just ahead of the curve. And with the album done, once again, they hit the road with Attack Attack, Escape the Fate, Bring Me the Horizon, and Motionless and White, among many others, as well as contributing a Bruno Mars cover to Punk Goes Pop Volume 4. When I see your face. And they also changed labels, graduating from Equal Vision to Fearless. And all of that set the stage for their next album, Collide With The Sky, which came out in the summer of 2012, as they were right in the middle of playing that year's Warp Tour. Just perfect timing. And another case of perfect timing came in the form of the lead single, King For A Day, featuring Kellen Quinn of Sleeping With Sirens, when Sleeping With Sirens were hitting the absolute peak of their popularity as well. The second single was Bulls in the Bronx, which was inspired by a fan who unfortunately took her own life. And I am by no means suggesting that they did that in any sort of cynical way, but still this song felt very on trend for 2012 because this was just a big topic at the time with the self-harm organization to write love on her arms all over Warp Tour and other bands like Of Mice and Men and Memphis May Fire also very directly writing songs addressing things like depression and self-harm. And Again, there's a lot of really cool progressive experimental touches on this album. For example, the Spanish guitar elements in Bulls in the Bronx, contrasted with a song like The First Punch that could almost sound like Trivium or something in places. Basically, this was almost the perfect record sonically and topically for the 2012 Warp Tour Tumblr kind of scene that they were part of, and it's still considered their best album by a lot of their fans. All of which led to Collide the Sky hitting number 12 on Billboard, which was an incredible accomplishment for a band that had been around for less than five years, and during a time where the popularity of rock in general was way lower than ever. And to me, it's especially impressive given that, like I said, their music was not exactly the most accessible stuff in the world. It was almost like aggressively weird. And what I mean by that is that I get why bands like My Chemical Romance or Paramore blew up because their songs are basically just like really good pop rock songs in emo clothes, but that's not Pierce the Veil. Their songs were kind of unstructured and experimental and well, 
just weird. And if you compared their career to other bands that started in that 2005 to 2007 kind of time, like Chiodos, Alasana, Icy Stars, or Amorosa, almost all those other bands have kind of stalled out in terms of popularity, while Pierce the Veil was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Which brings us to their next album, Misadventures. This was originally supposed to come out in 2014, then it was pushed to 2015, and then it was pushed back again, eventually coming out in 2016. It finally happened, it's finally here. Misadventures Adventures, our new record is out now worldwide. Thank and with their last album being so successful, expectations were high. Were they delaying the album because they were struggling in the studio? Did the label not like it? Was this going to be a disappointment compared to their last album that everyone loved? And with the release of this album, they showed that the answer to all of those questions was no. With Misadventures debuting at an amazing number four on Billboard and getting extremely positive reviews from pretty much everyone. Stay For example, Alternative Press, which at the time was kind of the definitive publication in their scene, said, Every single track is a winner. Misadventures expertly redraws Pierce the Veil's own map, celebrating their impossible blend of ambitious creative obsessions and the electric crackle of raw intensity. In these days, it seems like most of their fans do like this album, but rank it just below Collide with the Sky and Selfish Machines, and I think I personally would agree with that. Objectively, there's nothing at all wrong with this album. Album. Like it is definitely solid from start to finish, but at least to me, it's kind of missing the experimental feel and high energy of those other two albums, which I think is something you see a lot of. A band's most commercially successful album oftentimes comes after their creative peak. For example, the last three Fall Out Boy albums all charted higher than From Under the Cork Tree. But does anybody think that those are better? I would hope not. But regardless of the reviews or fan opinion, the fact of the matter is that hitting number four on Billboard was incredible. Like they outsold Rihanna that week, which is absolutely insane for a Warp Tour band. It seemed like Pierce the Veil was on fire and nothing could stop them. But in 2017, something happened that would change the band's history forever. The core of Pierce the Veil has always been Vic Fuentes on guitar and vocals and Mike Fuentes on drums, the two brothers who started the band and wrote the majority of the songs. And in 2017, an anonymous Twitter user accused Mike Fuentes of soliciting inappropriate photos from a 16 year old fan and later being intimate with her despite the fact that he was allegedly in his 20s at the time, including screenshots of somebody that certainly appeared to be him. Then a second woman came forward and said that he asked her for inappropriate photos as well when she was 14 or 15 years old. I obviously don't know what did or didn't happen, but shortly after that, he announced that he was stepping down from the band with a statement that read in part, I love playing music more than anything on earth and I am constantly humbled by the support of our fans. I do not want the allegations surrounding me to negatively affect the reputation or future of the band or to break the bond and trust that we have created with our fans over the years. So I have decided to take a break and step away from my position in the band in hopes that this will allow my bandmates and fans to continue focusing on the music and message that Pierce the Veil stands for. And so in the wake of those allegations, they canceled their upcoming tour with All Time Low and the band's future was uncertain. Allegations like that could destroy a band's reputation forever. And aside from that, one of the core members of the band was no longer part of it. But after a few months, Vic announced that he was working on a new album, apparently without his brother Mike. Although in 2020, they posted a studio update, which did appear to include Mike, which confused fans. Was Mike in the band or not? Vic clarified that Mike was indeed out of the band, but the years went on with no music and people wondered, was the band just going to kind of quietly break up? And if they did come back, would anybody even care? And the first sign that yes, people did still care about Pierce the Veil came in late 2022 when King for a Day started trending on TikTok kind of out of nowhere. And it got enough viral traction that the song eventually hit number one on the Billboard rock charts again, even 10 years after its release. And what I thought was the most interesting part is that a lot of these TikToks were coming from people who seemed to be too young to have really heard the song when it came out, meaning that a whole new generation of fans were discovering Pierce the Veil. Please, won't you push me for the last time? Let's give it to the 
And I don't think the whole TikTok trend was anything that they did intentionally, but if it was, then they did a great job because it was perfect timing to lead up to the day that their latest album, Jaws of Life, was finally released in February of 2023 after seven years with no new music. And this album was probably their biggest stylistic shift yet, drawing more from 90s grunge like Silverchair or Nirvana than the progressive post-hardcore of their earlier albums. And as of the time that I'm recording this, it's only been out for a few weeks, but the fan reactions seem to be overall kind of mixed with some people loving it, but most people feeling kind of let down by the change in sound. But that could certainly change over time because almost any time that a band makes any sort of big stylistic change like that, the old school fans pretty much always react to it negatively, but oftentimes you see them kind of warm up to the album over the years. For example, how the opinions on Pinkerton by Weezer did like a complete 180 within a couple years after the album came out or the ultimate example these days it seems like people even like St. Anger and if people like St. Anger well anything is possible rock and roll St. Anger which brings us to the last question what's next for Pierce the Veil and what will their lasting impact and legacy be well if you asked me this question even a year ago I might have put them in the same category as all the scene bands that were popular 10 years ago but became pretty much totally irrelevant almost overnight for example Bless the Fall hitting number 15 on Billboard in 2013 and then just kind of quietly breaking up late last year without anybody even noticing but even if the fans aren't really loving the Jaws of Life I I think Pierce the Veil have proven that they are here to stay and that they are relevant to a whole new generation of fans, not just the elder emos who liked them in high school 10 years ago. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos and podcasts early. I do giveaways. There are members only channels in my discord that I'm super active in. And there is even a way to have me review your music if that is something you're interested in. So if that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will We'll see you next time.